Thank you, girls. And now it's time to move on to a little something we call the spotlight. Would you do a pimple cream commercial on camera if Corny asked you to? I'd be proud to. Luckily, I've never been cursed with acne, like others. But I realize the devastating effect of skin blemishes on the social life of teenagers. Would you ever swim in an integrated swimming pool? I certainly would, Iggy. I'm a modern kind of girl. I'm all for integration. Aren't you a little fat for the show? That's enough, Amber. I would imagine that many of the home viewers are also pleasantly plump or chunky. Oh, come on. The show's not filmed in CinemaScope. You're out of line, Amber. Corny, Tammy, can't you see? This girl's a trash can. That's five demerit points. You're suspended from the show today. Pack up your things and go home. Oh, my God. But I was supposed to leave the ladies' choice. I'm sure we can find a replacement. Yes, Corny. Please wait outside. The council will now meet in secret, debate your personality flaws, and come to a final decision. Hello, and welcome to Book vs. Movie. This is a podcast where we read books that have been adapted into movies, and then we try to decide which we like better, the book or the movie. I am Margot P. of ColoniaBook.com, and this is my good friend and co-host, Margot D. of Brooklyn Vidic. Hi, everyone. It is musicals in March. Yes. It's super rainy here in San Diego. So we're not doing singing in the rain. Um, we may be singing. <laughs> so We may a few times morning. break into song just to, yeah. <laughs> We have a really fun episode that we're going to be talking about today. And um, if you're new and you're looking at the title of this episode and you're thinking like, I didn't realize that this was based on a book. It's not. Not really. Um, When the pandemic started, we decided to do a brand new episode every single week. And that means we're kind of stretching what we mean by book. Um, to mean really any adaptation whatsoever. So as long as it has been adapted from a literary source, in this case, um, a a film script, a non-musical film strip, script, although I would argue it's it's a semi-musical film strip, <laughs> script, film strip. As long as it's adapted from something, you know, some literary source, a magazine article, a short story, a novella, a play, we will consider it. Um, and in March, March, we do musicals. So last week we did Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Today we're going to be talking about hairspray. You know, Margo, yes, I have a Margo. dream when I close my eyes. I have a dream when I close my eyes. I wish my hair was 10 feet high. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot wait to talk about hairspray. I'm very excited. But if you have suggestions, of other books and movies or musicals and movies that we can do we're still looking for this month um there's places where you can make those suggestions meet other listeners and interact with us on the internet we have a basic facebook page be sure to like it all the episodes are posted there but then we also have a private facebook group and in the facebook group we're much more interactive and we talk just about books and movies there and pop culture movie stars that kind of thing and it's a fun place to hang out and offer your suggestions we always ask that the original source be something pretty easy to get our hands on and that the film needs to be streaming on a major device major app because if we have to buy the dvd vhs thing from canada or something it's just not going to work out it needs to be something everybody can get their hands on we are on twitter and instagram book versus and movie and we also have an old-timey email book versus movie podcast spelled it all out at gmail.com and if you really enjoy the show and would like to help keep us in books and movies you can support us on patreon P-A-T-R-E-O-N. We've been doing the show now for nine years. So we're trying to keep the feed that you are on right now, the free feed, that is from the past two years. So we're putting everything from 2021 and then previous to that up on our Patreon wall. We just put up Total Recall, which is a super fun episode. And it just helps us with the cost for books and movies and also for the software, for putting the show together, the platform and stuff like that. Thank you all so much. And somebody did sign up and then they asked for stickers, but they didn't give me their their address so please give me your address if you would Oopsie. like stickers yes 
<laughs> also, if you just want stickers, we have them. <laughs> we have them. So if you uh, if you'd like some, please send us an email. We'd be happy to drop them in the mail for you. It's Madison time. Hit it. Baltimore, 1962. You're looking good. A bit the heyday of hairdos and hair. We shall well, overcome say, someday. Not with that hair, you won't. Heartthrobs and hefty girls. Mama, yeah. welcome to the 60s. Hot dates and hip talkers. No matter what you've heard, we are going to teach the white children how to do the birth. I'm Hair Hoppers. I can't see through her hair. And one magic potion that holds it all together. They put me in special and just cut my hair. The times, they're changing. Something's blowing in the wind. Let's get naked and smoke. Simple. That's my diet pills, would you, hon? Oh, mother, you're so 50s. Starring Sonny Bono, Ruth Brown, Devon, Michael St. Gerard, Debbie Harry, Ricky Lake, Jerry Stiller, and Sean Thompson. The new comedy from John Waters. It's way beyond Greece. I'm so excited about today. I don't even <laughs> know where to begin, but I'm going to begin with what, what happened last week, um, which is right at the end of our discussion of uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch, like literally as we were talking about it, we received news about one of a series of uh, anti-drag specifically uh, bills passing, this one in Tennessee, play that we were discussing, the musical that we were discussing last week, as we were talking about it, became illegal to perform in the state of Tennessee. Um, And so... Because we were super bummed about that, we decided to pick a musical for this week that is very fun and you can't be in a bad mood and it's about defeating hate. It is also illegal to perform in Tennessee. I did a little bit of research this week, too. I found numerous Many, many productions, high school productions of Hairspray done by high schools in the state of Tennessee over the last few years. And um, it's so sad that kids aren't going to be able to do this show anymore. Unless, I guess, if you make it a woman playing Edna, I guess. I guess, but still. Yeah, I'm not so sure. All of this springs from a, a national treasure, someone we're very lucky to live in the same time as Mr. John Waters. I'm such a fan. I am. You know, I didn't realize this, Margo, and it, it took me a few minutes to realize, like, I've met John Waters and Divine. Have you really? I have. Because I, wow. I used to hang out at a radio station. Like, John Waters was a kid. He's from Baltimore, born 1946, and he's just a multi-hyphenate writer, director, avant-garde artist. Bon vivant. Bon vivant <laughs> to the max. Someone who lives out loud and exactly who he is. Uh, just a, such an amazing person. But I used to, like, he was obsessed with a show called The Buddy Dean Show when he was a teenager. And this was in Baltimore. And it was a dance show. And there used to be all these regional dance shows around the country starting in the 50s and going right up through the 80s. There were a couple of shows in yeah. my area. Yeah. Pretty much as soon as the baby boomers 
um, the baby boomers came of age right at the time when television was also coming of age. And it was this, it was a massive demographic um, and they, that they could sell to. And so, yeah, what are you just printing money at that point and having kids dance on TV? It's cheap. It's easy. And these kids would come cele- become celebrities in their local markets. And I would think it was WJZ TV. If I'm wrong, I'm sorry about that. But there is that was John Waters local program. And it was from 1957 to 1964. And Buddy Dean had an, a segregated show. And Baltimore, I never think of as the South, but it's actually very closely associated with the South. Oh, it is very much the South. It's yeah. the South of the North, for sure. Yeah, for the right. And it's hard to explain, like, if you're outside the States, what that means. But there's this culture of racism and of uh, they were on the side for the Civil War on the, you know, the rotten side. But this is a he was. A fan of this show, but he didn't. Re- they, they played. It was black. It was also rock music was coming into the fore, and people like Elvis were taking like the scary version of rock songs and making them more palatable for teenagers. Lots of people were, you know, Pat Boone would like take Little Richard Records and record his own version of really sexy version of Tutti Frutti. Wow, um, but. Um, in Baltimore, they they were segregated. This was considered the South, and they would not have black teens dancing with each other in the same day. There was one day a month that was uh, the Negro Day, and that's when those... I mean, that's what they called it. That's what they called it, and they called the music, yeah. R&B music, they called it race music. Yeah. And that's the <laughs> stuff he loved. He did not care about... Pat Boone or any of that other stuff. He was a huge fan and he became a few huge fan of these kids and he stayed with it. And then he, he was born in 1946. He eventually leaves and he goes to New York university and then he comes back to Maryland. He's very much a Baltimore guy. I don't want to mean to crap all over Baltimore. I like Baltimore. I've been there and it's a, it's a great place, but he, Same. Yeah. yeah, he, but he's written movies. Like he's known for pink flamingos, female trouble. There's a uh, multiple, maniacs he's a filmmaker that just like like warhol he's someone who hires his friends has this coterie of artists yeah and he They're, loves the freaks it, of nature he loves the weird it's people. hard yeah and it's hard to it's hard if you're look, you know looking at him from a you know where we live today in the 21st century in the era of youtube and independent creators all over the place like that was not a thing that existed then right just like with Warhol's a good analogy, you know, Waters was so out there and people just did not know what to make of this stuff. And it's campy, it's kitschy. It's also very serious social criticism. You know, he, Baltimore is always kind of at the core of, of everything he does, but he's using, he always uses Baltimore. It's not about lampooning his home city. It's about using his home city as a stand in for mainstream American culture and, um, the things that are wrong with it. But, it, you know, if you look at his work as a, as a whole body of work, it is, a, he clearly loves where he's from. And it's cool. You know, it's a great place. It is. Yeah. Yes, it is. But anyway, at the time, people were just like, who is this freak? Why? Like, what? Drag queen is the. And anyway, and so he just pushed the envelope farther and farther and farther. Eventually, with this group, with this same kind of group of friend slash friend slash actors that he was working with, who I think he could probably get to do things maybe he couldn't get like a hired yes. <laughs> uh, as a uh, if he did a cattle call and, and hired people, um, maybe, uh, but because people didn't know who he was or what he was doing. But eventually, like he hairspray is a really big breakthrough mainstream um hit of his and hairspray is really a turning point in his career where he has a slightly bigger budget but also his um the message it has such a it has a, a much more straightforward message than his other work um which i love like what's that one with tab hunter polyester 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 oh i love that one Mm -hmm. love that movie but hairspray has a very clear message and it has 
amazing music. I'm talking about the original one. Amazing music. An absolutely captivating main character uh, played by Ricky Lake and her mom played by by Divine. It is a yeah. It's I remember watching it, and and I was very familiar with John Waters' uh, works by then. They would play back then in those days. Um, San Diego had I'm going to say a good half dozen art houses. We have several colleges, so the colleges would have midnight movies and stuff too. And so we we got to see all this stuff all the time. And so when um, I remember when Hairspray came out, that it was playing in one of the art houses and I saw it over and over and over again. I saw it so many times and I own the soundtrack. And I mean, I never get tired of this movie. Um, I'm nodding. Yep. (laughs) Yeah. Right. It was a big deal. Right. Because he had people, you had Debbie Harry and polyester. There's a big scene where divine whose name was Glenn Milstead, who sadly Dan died, excuse me, just a month after the movie came out originally. There's a scene where divine who was a gay man who played in drag, who played women characters. And he made that distinction. He did not do this in life. No, when he always he always used the pronouns he him. Is that correct? Right. Right. Um, I want to point out too. You just reminded me. Um, so the the if you I'm assuming we're assuming that you're familiar with this movie, guys, and um, so we're not spoiling anything. <laughs> right. But um, and there are some differences between the original movie and the musical in terms of the plot and whatnot. Um, but I also want to point out that when this movie comes out, and the movie is about um, segregation, it's about civil rights. It's it's uses you know the segregation between blacks and whites um, to tell the story. But the movie is coming out with Divine playing the main one of the main roles and also a supporting role. The movie is coming out at the height of the AIDS epidemic, the height of AIDS scare and homophobia. It really, really. Uh, and we've talked about it before with some of the other movies that we've covered, but it was a really, really frightening time. There was talk of can't we just ship all of the people with AIDS to an island and somewhere and just let them die off? I mean, it was that bad. Mm-hmm. Um, there were politicians who were proposing things like this. So that conversation was happening with the LGBTQ community um, in its crosshairs. And this, so this movie is coming along at a really special time in, in history that we can look at another similar point in history and think about what side we're on. So he was a fan of this show, and then he goes to college, and in the 60s and 70s, he does a lot of experimental work. So here he is. It's the 1980s, and in 83, 84, he goes to this convention of fans of the original Buddy Dean show, and he and he was a super fan. Like he loved all the dancers. He, you know, had telegrams sent to the show. He would follow them outside. Like I'm, I'm such the person because at the time that he's this movie comes out there's a radio station in san francisco called live 105 and alex bennett had a morning show and you were live studio audience and i used to get up four in the morning to go to be in the live studio did you dress up no but i i was pretty i was young and i was pretty and i like would laugh at anything and i would clap so they loved me so like i got to be me and my younger brother got to be kind of regular so i've met so john waters came was there just one day by whatever reason he was promoting another book and it was and i because i was a regular they gave me a seat and he's lovely he's very smart he's so he's somebody who has like this wild imagination but he presents as a very normal regular person i don't know how to explain it he just just doesn't he, he you know he's, charming. He, he, he's very charming and I you know we can only kind of gather from his work and again like his use of Baltimore in his work that he's probably somebody who growing up as a queer kid yeah in such an environment that he was pretty adept at code switching and he is extremely bright um, and a really really good writer i don't know if you've ever read role models did you ever read role models no it's on my list now oh it's so good 
it's a really good book. He's a great writer. He used to write for Condé Nast yeah. publications. He was always on oh, yeah, party the lists when I was there. Mm-hmm. And he, so he's very funny, just super whip smart and very, very funny. And he goes to this in the mid 80s. He writes for Baltimore magazine about going to this convention and meeting these kids. And, you know, they the show basically was shut down because they didn't. American Bandstand, which was started around the same time and went on way through the 80s. Like we grew up with American Bandstand. In Philadelphia, right? In Philadelphia. Uh Always and always integrated. There was never segregation. But the thing was, is black kids had to black with dance. Black kids. They couldn't. You could. Blacks and whites couldn't dance together. That's not until the 70s or 80s. (laughs) What can I tell you guys? This is so medieval. It does. Oh, man. I know. I know. And so, yeah, so we get upset when we hear things popping up again that are like no 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 this has been settled we don't do this right so he writes about this story and that gives him the idea of what if I were to come up with something called the Corny Collins show and it's here in Baltimore and then I have a girl that doesn't fit doesn't fit in but she's going to help be the progressive voice and sure the white savior thing but Tracy Tracy Turnblad is the character Tracy Turnblad is one of the my favorite characters ever. She's up there with Wonder Woman for me. Seriously, she's she's a superhero. I love Tracy Turnblad, and even if the musical never happened, I mean, she he, he's written it so because he's not. It, it's not a white savior thing. Like it could it could, it could easily be, have not. gone that way, and especially at that point in our history, like that was such a thing to have. I mean. Listen to our episode about the help. It only got worse. Yeah, it only got worse. She is definitely someone who is, she's a child, you know, and it's, it's again, it's pointing out how hate is a learned mm-hmm. thing, um, a cultural thing, perhaps, that maybe you're not aware that you're learning it. You just like the way things are, but it is, it's not something, you know, it's not a real thing. She is starting to question that because she understands that people judge her by the way that she looks. Um, but but she's not like, come on, come on, you black kids. I'm going to take care of this. She's not that at all. She's She is supporting them. She's right. mainly like, how can I help you? She's an ally. Tell me, yeah, tell me how I can be here for you. And, um, and the, and it's the, the, black characters who really speaking for themselves in terms of like, this is what we're dealing with. And yeah, it sucks, but you know, what can we do to change it? But they are really, they have agency. You know, they are really the ones who are creating, creating the change. Um, She's supporting them, but she's, she's not, what's his name? She's not Kevin Costner busting down the stupid, uh, the, the whites only sign on the restroom, which never happened, by the way. <laughs> right. I'm just keep bringing that up that that never happened. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so she's, yeah, I just, cause he just has written it. He understands that again, as a queer man who grew up in that era and witnessed these events, he, uh, he has a really deep understanding of that. Yeah. She's no more a white savior than, what do you want to say a heterosexual savior either you know she's 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 a teenager who was trying to make sense of her world um who wants to believe that uh, she lives in a country that she's told she lives in which is one that believes in justice and fairness and um is a meritocracy um which i can never say with a straight face yeah she's she's not that she's not that and and I think that's maybe one of the things that we responded to so much at the time about it. She's just, and it's also Ricky Lake. I mean, let's face it. I never really give her enough credit because I think she she doesn't get enough credit. She, she, she deserves way more credit. She is. So her character is Tracy Turnblad and the story is set in 1962 in Baltimore. Her dad runs a joke shop (laughs) where they sell like buzzers. Her dad, Jerry Stiller. I mean, oh my gosh, her parents are divine and Jerry Stiller. Which is what is better than that? And nothing. Yeah, and she has a best friend, Penny Pingleton, and Penny's always being permanently punished by her. Also Who underrated. Mother. She's a she's very funny. You are permanently punished. <laughs> and there's so there's this dance show, and she has the hots for a guy named Link. And it's Michael St. Gerard who played Elvis 
in a few different productions of things. Because he's very Elvisy. He's very Elvisy. He's super handsome. He became a priest. He's like a preacher in New York City now. Really? Yep, in Harlem. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. I never knew that. Oh, I was wow. like getting into all this. And her, so she has this one main rival with his Amber. Amber, who is blonde and skinny. Also underrated. She, vitamin she, C. Vitamin C. I didn't know that. I got her and Penny Neither Pingleton did I. mixed up. I know Angela pointed out. And I've been looking up a vitamin C now as a music executive. It does really well. She's very funny. And very she's so mean. good in this. She's the villain in the piece. And right. she is, she's really good. She's a very good actor. Awesome dancer. Great dancer. But uh, she's really good. Really, really good. She's a perfect, perfect foil. Ricky Lake is so just like exuberant. The moment you see her, great. you love her. She's a fantastic dancer. She really holds her own. So you like when she when they have like a dance off, like she's really killing it. Good. She has big hair because that's what she sees the girls on the TV have. So she gets her hair bigger and bigger. She is such a lovely person. She gives people a break. She just, you know, she she's so warm and funny and, and open and all. And she has this, you know, her heart's just on her sleeve. Like she just has the big hots for Link the second she meets him. But Amber, her mother is Debbie Harry and Sony, Sonny Bono. <laughs> Her parents are Debbie Harriet Sunny and they're Bono. Funny. Are you kidding me? They're so funny. Time for you know what? Mother, I know all the dances. Come on, get up, get up. Practice makes perfect. I ought to know. Don't forget, I was Miss Self Crab in 1945, and that title wasn't handed to me on a silver platter. I worked for it. Now, come on, a one, two, a one, two, three, pony! Mashed potatoes? Faster! Amber, I'd like to talk to you. Yes, Daddy? Don't stop, cha-cha. I'm tired. One, two, cha-cha-cha, one, two, cha-cha-cha. I had some new campaign flyers made up today. All for Daddy's little girl. Now, I want you to hand those out at the hop tonight to everyone, each and every one of those. Twist! Oh, Daddy! No lip from you, Miss Ingrate. This campaign is costing us an arm and a leg. New gowns? Hairdresser three times a week? Why, your hairspray bill alone is enough to eat up all the profits from the tilt world You'll do as Daddy says, or we'll send you to Catholic school where you belong. Right, Franklin? That's right. The writing in this is so hilarious. Um, I mean, it's all John Waters style. Everything is heightened. Everything is extra kitschy. People are talking in like beer commercial slogans. And it's so witty and so funny and so sharp. Uh, And you're laughing at them, but you're also laughing at yourself because you realize as you're watching them talk in these commercials, like, we totally buy into how much you actually buy into the American, you know, commercial culture and all of that. He, he really he has a way of getting you to laugh at yourself by laughing yeah. at these characters. Those They're kids, brilliant. the kids are great dancers, by the way. They're super good. There's so much music in this movie. If you've never seen it, the, this soundtrack, I loved this soundtrack. So, I mean, this? I wore it out. I wore it out. Uh, I so Erica Bromley from F, F this movie. This is her favorite movie of all time. We've talked about it. It's before. one of the greatest and we movies. Both said like I know every song on this soundtrack. I me too. I know all the dance moves. I'm not good. I at know them. all the words. I know all the words. Yeah, I can't do those moves, but I know them. I know them. These. If kids, you showed me with no sound, I could tell you. Oh, that's the Madison. That's the oh, Madison. that's shake a tail feather. That's mashed potato. That's gravy. Yeah, they're the. It's uh, I'm blue when they're doing the twerking. Uh, ugh, it's just there's this whole. It, it, so she just wants to join this dance team and Amber is giving her a hard time because she's chubby, but then she turns out to be a great dancer and they realize like, well, you know, she'll represent somebody in the audience. Very, and, and I love it. This movie just moves. I mean, it just goes from one thing to the other. There's jokes on top of the jokes. It's also, it's always got those weird little John Waters touches. Like uh, Amber goes to her mother and says, I have a blemish. And her mom just pops out the gloves and you hear the squirt. Boom. He always has like a gross yes. uh, factor, which is just like, which oh, is amazing. Come on. I just come love on. it. So she's dancing with Link and then, uh, and her parents, 
at, at first they're terrified of her, but they're they're so loving and support. I love it when she says, "Look at Tracy, big as a house," and Jerry Stills says, "I think she looks real pretty, Edna." I just those little exchanges that they have. But Tracy becomes super popular because she's Tracy. She's fun and she's a bullion, and she becomes friends. She goes with Mother Maybell. Mother Maybell. They have the Negro Day on the fourth th- Thursday of every month. <laughs> Yeah. With Ruth like Brown. Like February. Like yes. the shortest month is Black History Month. Ruth Brown. Oh, he got Ruth Brown. Are you kidding me? Yeah. I mean, even when even I was a teenager going to see this movie, knew who Ruth Brown was. Because this was around the same time. I'm going to look that up. I believe this is around the same time as um, the musical Black and Blue. Oh. Remember Black and Blue? Oh. Um, where she sings that song about... Uh, if I can't sell it, I'm going to sit down <laughs> on it. <laughs> but Ruth Brown, jeez, oh, man. Was she what had, a powerhouse. Uh, she So that's Mother Maybell, and Mother Maybell has two kids, and she runs a record store, and she also runs the Negro Day once a month. And so Tracy and Link, and he's a sweet guy, too. He completely loves her. They go to this spot and that's where she we also Nadine was one of the girls that tried out for the show but because she's black they said can't join us and Tracy's immediately is like well that doesn't seem fair I mean she's a good dancer yeah it's just I thought cares? this was about dancing you said right. it was about dancing yeah right and so she meets the those kids and Penny's it's very funny scene Penny's mother shows up in Baltimore screaming at all the black people because she's terrified and it's it's played for laughs and it is funny she's a ludicrous character but then they, but she's she, saying things that people say yeah that people say even today um but then when you see this woman on in this movie screaming it at the top of her lungs you realize how ridiculous it is it's yes exactly so, and she's she's i want to just point out she also she I, okay john waters cameos in both of these movies so she she snatches up penny and she's got this like I don't know what he is like it's like a cult deprogrammer. Oh right, with the person who was shocking her, hit, trying to hypnotize her, pooking her with a cattle prod. And again, this is about the time that that gay conversion therapy is really starting to take off. And these are the sorts of things that they were doing. And so they have John Waters playing this character who is. Uh, racist uh, conversion therapy, but converting her to a racist, not from a racist. Penny, this is Dr. Fredrickson. He's a psychiatrist, and he's going to make you all better. Feeling really depressed, Penny? That's Want to a- talk about it? The wheel. Think of all the That's white boys in school and how much you like the date one. Look what Be a good little girl and slip this on. I'm telling you, shock call. treatments are the answer. Come here, Penny. Come on, honey. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good girl. Good afternoon, Penny. Feeling better? Getting in touch with your anger? Go, Police brutality! Police brutality! Using these tactics. Well, be beats. I mean, <laughs> Tracy's hair is such a problem because her hair gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> That they send her into special ed. And that's where she says, like, well, that's where you send the black kids who give you a give you a hard time. She points out the injustices and like she sees it and she tells people like, yeah. to their face. So she becomes friend with Seaweed, and it turns out Seaweed is the son of Mother Maybell, and Seaweed and Penny Pen- Pendel- Pendleton, uh, Penny Pingleton have an attraction right off the bat. And that's par- partly what's freaking her mother out because he's a black guy and no, no, that can't happen. Then what happens basically, just to move it along, is that the seaweed's little sister, little Inez, he brings her to the show because there's a day where the kids get to, little kids get to dance. And Yeah, it's like bring your little brothers and sisters to yeah. the show. Yeah, and she, so he brings his little sister and they say, no, it's, it's the Negro Day, the end of the month, she can't come in there. And, they, and they're like, what is, what's a big deal? And then we also should say we have Corny Collins, we have a woman, Mink Stoll, who's like one of the... She's, I'm sorry, Mink Stoll's a woman. She's in, she's in all of his 
all of his most well-known works. She's, yeah, she's, she's really good. She's really good. They're all really good. They want to integrate the show. They're like, this is perfect. Bring the kids on. It's, then it'll be, it's people to see. This is no big deal. But the, but the, the racist owner, which is also played by divine, he's doing two characters is saying no. So Tracy goes against the rules. And so she starts protesting and then the cops are called in. And so, tra- and at this, by the way, Edna had been, she gave Edna a glamorous makeover. You know, the hefty hideaway made her a sponsor. <laughs> they sponsor her segments. But she and her boyfriends are trying to get away because they're going to be arrested because they're hanging out together. And it's in, there's the segregation laws. And this is where they wind up in the home of hipsters. And it's Pia Zadora. <laughs> this is not in the musical. And I, I the, okay, we'll talk about the musical a little bit, which I like, but. I don't like as much of this movie. Spoiler alert. I just, this yeah, is the same. I'm sorry. This is like so groundbreaking. This movie. I love it. This was always one of my favorite scenes in this movie. And I don't know why it's not in the musical, but yeah, they bust it. So they're they're at this point. They're kind of, they're quote unquote outlaws. Right. And they run into an apartment and it's a home of these beatnik types played by Pia Zadora. And Rick Ocasek. And, uh, and Rick Ocasek. They're, they're really out there. Come on. Open up. Come on, let's go. Can we come in? Jeez. Come on, guys. Come on. Come on. Like, hi, cats. Sit down. You got the bus chasing you? No, we were. <sighs> you, you guys are real beatniks. Just like New York. Daylights are coming, and you wanna go home. You two checkerboard chicks, what? Do you know black and white, salt and pepper? Well, yes, I am a checkerboard chick, I guess. Whoa. Whoa. <sighs> I'm an integrationist. Yes. We shall overcome someday. Not with that hair, you won't. You look like a hair hopper to me. I mean, your hair is really uncool. How do you get your hair so straight and and so flat? With an iron, man. I play my bongos, listen to Odetta, and then I iron my hair, dig? I think we better get going now. The coast looks clear. Let's do some reefer. We'll get high and I'll iron the chick's hair. Reefer? Drugs? Loco weed. When I'm high, I am Odetta. Let's get naked and smoke. Cool. Don't breathe it in. You'll be addicted. But later, sister, later. Much later. I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterical, naked, dragging themselves through... They're yeah. really, really out there. And these kids are like, ooh, we might have stepped into the deep end like a little faster than we meant to. But when she talks about like Pia Zadora, very it's funny. Like, your hair's so big. We gotta iron, you gotta iron your hair, you know. Like I get high and I read I read poetry and I iron my hair, man. And that whole thing about the ironing of the hair, like the hair gets bigger. As she's trying to fit in, and then when she realized, like, screw this, what am I trying to fit in for? Then she, then now she's ironing her hair. I love the whole thing about the ironing of the hair. I don't know why it's not in the musical because I thought it was so funny. It was also a big part of it, but I also think <laughs> mm-hmm. Pia Zadora is hilarious in this part. She's very, very funny. She's she and Rick O'Casey yeah. are really funny, but they like what her line is. Let's get naked and smoke, and they're like, oh no, <laughs> <laughs> so they take off. But so then we also we should, we should say that Sonny Bono owns the Tilt a Whirl. That's his big, uh, yeah, like an amusement park, right? And it's it's mm-hmm. segregated. You know, there's like one day a month that black people can go, and they're gonna have an auto show there, and whoever's crowned. The queen of the auto show will then get a crown, and she's going to be made a big deal. And so this is Amber's been amping for this the whole time. And Amber, once again, she's beautiful. She's blonde, and she's a great dancer, really snotty. 
you know, but she's and she hates Tracy and she but her so her parents show up at this at the very end. And Debbie Harry has a wig that's just like nothing I've ever seen before. It's about 40 inches tall. It has to be. Tracy. So Tracy at the at the start of this scene where they have the auto show, they're going to crown the queen of the auto show. Tracy's in reform school. She's been picked up by the police. <laughs> I forgot about that. She's in reform school. And this is not in the musical at all, but I don't know why, because it's so brilliant. So she's in reform school and she's watching it on all this unfold on television. And she has now like organized all the girls in the reform school and they're all ironing each other's hair. <laughs> and her parents are at home divine is like maybe she could be like a campus leader it's you know it, there's, uh-huh. a, there's a change in the there's something blowing in the wind fetch me my diet pills <laughs> it's just so many great lines in this movie and right you've made, you're missing that because it's got that grittiness to it i love it when tracy's like sent out of the reform school and they're all doing that roach dance and the it's just She's got the gall gown. She, when she gets out of the uh, reform school, she busts out. I forget how. Um, she gets to the car show in time because she has won. They, they voted. She was voted the queen of the car show. But because she was in reform school, they're giving it to Amber. And so Amber's about to be crowned. And Tracy turns up and she's because Amber's spreading rumors about Tracy that she's a slut, that she um, is dirty and that she's she's adopted. <laughs> she's got <laughs> which is all these things people said in like in the 60s. Oh, my God. It's so dumb. It's really dumb. And, and uh, but Tracy shows up in this beautiful pink ball gown with giant roaches, satin roaches, like um, what's the word? Applicade onto her gown, and it's like you know, I'll show you who's you know. And she, and they have a dance off, and she wins. And and uh, oh, we forgot to about getting back to Debbie Harry's hair. So she's got a bomb planted in her hair. <laughs> of course. <laughs> which, which which one? What you do? the things don't go your way you have to sort of make them happen so she has this so Sonny Bono has helped her because he doesn't want to integrate the tilt world either and there's all this pro- there's this protest going on outside between people who want segregation and people who don't want segregation so there's this bomb that's supposed to like they're, they're shoot it off if things go awry but it explodes on Debbie Harry's head and she's a good sport because there's that shot of her like all that soot on her it was like we're going home now Amber and just Amber Amber's like, no, she's so furious. But they win in the end because they don't care. They're just dancing. And then that's when it's decided it's integrated. And then everybody, it's great. It's so heartwarming. It's it so really funny. is. Tracy's the best. Tracy is such a great person, such a great character. There's so many touches. Like I love it when she's in reform school and then she sees Link on television <laughs> and she starts licking the screen. <laughs> It's so gross, but it makes I me I just laugh. love that whole, the, the beatniks in the reform school. I just love it's, that whole section yeah, well, of the movie so much. Yeah, this happened. I mean, these were things that were going on, and that's, it's it's all should be mentioned. And the hair hoppers and all that mm-hmm. stuff that, you know, people, people focusing on the wrong things. And not, right? Hello. Seriously. But this, it, the movie does really well. I mean, it has a very mm-hmm. small budget. And uh, I, I think I met Divine. It would have been like he was promoting the movie. So I was there when he was promoting it. And he looked normal. He wasn't like this flamboyant No, person. he would he would do, yeah, he would do the media and promotion not in drag at all. I can't, I still can't get over he was 42. Yeah. Was it a heart attack? <sighs> I think so. He had a lot of problems. He was very heavy. He gained an enormous amount of weight, like in a short amount of time, I think. I Or maybe mm-hmm. it ran in his family. I don't know. But it's kind of one of those, it's a cult classic. Like at the time, it did fine. I loved it. But it's I definitely when it went out on video and rentals, it kind of had this whole, and then it's one of those movies. There's there's nothing offensive going on in this movie. So it was on TV all the time. It really isn't. Yeah, you yeah. really... There's no swearing. Um, there's, no, I mean, the grossest thing is that she that p- the zit popping, the pimple thing. That's kind of it. It does so. It does very well. It becomes like this cult classic, and then we'll take this from the '80s into the early 2000s when they it was decided like let's see if we can transform this into a musical. 
on Broadway. And they have, I mean, the music is amazing. It's Mark Shaman and Scott Whitman, and they've worked on South Park. They've done a Saturday Night Live. They were working there for a long time. They did the movie Smash or the TV show Smash. They were in charge of that. So there's, there's this push to to sell it this i don't know if you remember you were in new york when this came out right because it's after 9 11 the play yeah which i oh, never yeah. saw oh, so we were we were nor did i but uh we were saying before we got on the air um when the show premiered it was directed by jack o'brien who was the um he was the artistic director of the Old Globe Theater here in San Diego. And, um, but although I don't think it premiered in San Diego, I kind of want to say that they, they premiered it in Seattle. Mm-hmm. Um, but Jack O'Brien um, at the time lived like two blocks away from me. Hairspray was such a mega hit. It was such a hit that he, um, he completely redid his house. <laughs> And then, um, I know. And then he sold it, sold it and, and moved to Broadway. Um, I think with the show, cause it was around that time that, that the house was sold. I just remembered a thing about his house. The original house was owned and he must've bought it from the family. I bet he did. It was owned by this, this little old lady that she, I don't ever remember her not being old, and it was this tiny little cottage. It was so cute, but it was real tiny. And um, and she was she was killed crossing the street right in front of her house. As I recall, that's how I remember it happening anyway. And I think Jack O'Brien was the one who bought the house. And, and it was still the little cottage for a long time. But then, like I said, when he hit it with hairspray, then all of a sudden it became like this big contemporary house, um, which it is today. And um, but no, I never did see it on on stage. Although I was saying, and I'd never seen this movie either. I'd only seen when they did it live on television. Same. And was was um, Marissa, Marissa Jarrett Winokur as Tracy and Harvey Firestein. Yep. As uh, as Edna. And I remember seeing like clips of it, but no, I never saw it on stage. It was sold out right away. It was a huge hit. Mm, oh, it was hit. a massive hit. And I mean, Harvey, Harvey Firestein alone. But people loved that Marissa Winokur. They loved her. They and mm-hmm. also, I mean, the theme. If you've seen the movie, you know what you're going to see. Basically, they mm-hmm. just they just change it a little bit in the production. It's like I said, I didn't see that originally. I'm going from what we see in the movie, which I'm going to assume is pretty much what happened with that their production. But they they make it, and it's a very sunny, fun, good music. It's it's perfect little Broadway show, and it's you know I can see why people come from out of town; they'd want to see something like this. It's just yeah, it's, and the songs are good; they're really good. Um, they, and I like too that it um, it could easily because the original movie has such an amazing soundtrack. Mm-hmm. They could easily have made this like a jukebox musical kind of a deal, but they didn't. It's all like original original music that pertains to the actual story and I think it's well done. Yeah, I do miss the song Hairspray by Rachel Sweet. I don't, why did we not have that song? I don't understand it's it. It's such a good song. It's such a great song. It's something that's always stuck in my head. And I, I think it's so perfect for the movie and it's so perfect for the whole show. But it does super well on Broadway. It makes, you know, gets lots of Tony nominations and awards. It sells out record numbers in London. I can just see why this is a huge hit. Just all over the world so of course it's very funny and i think it keeps i mean again i'm assuming that it's the same as the what we just what we're going to talk about the movie in 2007 um it does have some of the edge some of that water's edge but they're very those rough bits have been definitely polished up for broadway yes so let's play we forgot to say let's play the trailer for the 2007 movie and then we'll talk about this adaptation It was a time of tradition, a time of values, a time... People who are different, their time is coming. ...to shake things up. Not in Baltimore, it isn't. Hurry up, Penny, we're missing you. Yes. Starla. Holly. Noreen. Doreen. And I'm late. Ah! So if you're not just thinking that you lie in bed. That was a 
was our very own Link Larkin. And I'm Motormouth Maybell, pitching rhythm your way. Dancing on that show is my dream. <laughs> Wanna be one of the nicest kids in town? Cut school tomorrow and come audition. No one in this house is auditioning for anything. But Ma! Uh, Amber? Save your personal life for the camera, sweetie. Oh, shiny. Go on, get out there and show up. Council member, Miss Tracy Turnblad. First the hair, now this. Tracy certainly has redefined our standards. That's for sure. <laughs> when you follow your own beat. We get any more white people in here, it's gonna be a suburb. The world will follow you. I think no one uses the start of a pretty big adventure. Oh, 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 you can't stop today. No. As it comes speeding down the track. Child, yeah. yes, the day is history. Oh. And it's never coming back. Cause tomorrow. This is America. You gotta think big to be big. Big ain't the problem in this family, Wilbur. I think it's a weird experience to watch the first movie and then see the second one. It's yeah. so jarring. It is. <laughs> I, not in a terrible way, but it's jarring. Yeah. Um, Agreed. She's, I mean, she's adorable. Nikki Blonsky. That she is, I mean, she has that exact kind of little spark that Ricky Lake had that like the instant you see her on stage, I mean, on screen, you just instantly relate to her and love her and are rooting for her. Like the moment she opens her mouth and she just has that kind of openness of expression like Ricky Lake had in the in the original. Um, she, yeah, she's Tracy. She's Tracy Turnblad. I like that they really embrace the the Baltimore of it. I mean, this, the show opens with the Good Morning Baltimore, which is this mm -hmm. to Baltimore. I think we start even just from that very spot, spot. It's just it's a sparkly version of the original. What we did. It's it's been heightened. Mm -hmm. It's been cleaned up a little bit. We have movie stars that are playing these characters yeah yeah we do and uh i was i was completely shocked it was we have john travolta michelle pfeiffer christopher walken amanda Bynes, who's great as penny pingleton i think i think she's really james zach efron zach efron james marsden is really good britney snow is great it's queen latifah I forgot to mention she's their our mother maybell she i worked on i worked on her show a long time ago I am. Living that one. <laughs> yep. Single. No, her talk show, her original talk show, which came out. Oh, that was a good show. She was good at that. Yeah, we have some stories for you. Uh, that's for another day. <laughs> <laughs> another day, another time. She was fine. It was just some of her people. Uh, but anyway, they, so in the movie, she, uh, Amber's mother is single and she's a cougar and she's. Yeah. She's, and she's the manager of the station so so in other words we've taken um what in the original was the mink stole role and the debbie harry role and swooshed them together and gotten rid of the dad which works super well for this version of the story i think I, i'm not yeah. mad at it i think she has she's just a great villainess and in order to be a great villainess she has to have some power to wield over people and so um in a way that debbie harry's character doesn't really in the in the original so i yeah i like it yeah so we have james marsden he's the host of the corny collins show zach efron is really good as link he, he's excellent he's great i mean i have no yep. i told you i was like John Travolta, so they hired John. Once again, they hired a man to play the mother's part. It's just sort of the history of the presentation. 
and I have to ask, like, because you have family from Baltimore, you know, people from I Baltimore. Do. So I do. is that a real Baltimore accent that he's doing? Well, <sighs> no one is auditioning for anything in this household. But why not? Why Plus, not? Nancy is not your future. One day you're going to own Edna's Occidental Laundry. I don't want to be a laundress. I want to be famous. Well, if you want to be famous, learn how to take blood out of car upholstery. That's a skill you can take right to the bank. Hey, hey. What's all this word in here? Daddy, tomorrow I'm auditioning to dance on a TV no, show. No, she what? is not. First the hair, now this. But the, all the kids are batting up their hair now, hon. You're no help. It's ratting, Daddy. And our first lady, Jacqueline Kennedy, does it. I don't believe that. What do you mean you don't believe that? How else would it look that way? I believe that it is natural. What I can say is to my California ears, mm -hmm. it sounds like my family from Baltimore. Yes. Yeah, it's a weird, like I have an aunt who married a guy from Baltimore, and that's, and so I have cousins and that from there. Their accent is not that thick, but when we would go and visit them, like that's what it sounded like to me. I, it, does that mean it's authentic? I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, just like I think we all here in California sound like the Kardashians to everybody, you know? But yeah, to my California ears, it, you know, I, I can, uh, when he says, I love my iron on. Because <laughs> Divine is like, I got to do some ironing in here. Yeah, because is it Divine from there as well? Yeah, they were from childhood right? friends. Yeah. They, they, um. Travolta's but, doing a thing. But Travolta's like really turning up the Baltimore in a way that is so hilarious. Like it just. It makes every single thing out of Edna's mouth so funny. Even when she's sad, it's funny. You know, even it's it's really good. It is very, very good. So, so getting back to the differences, the main difference, yes, Michelle Pfeiffer is now the station manager. They're not competing for this car show. There's no there's no uh, amusement park. It's about a, a sponsor. One of the sponsors is running a beauty contest and Amber wants to win that. A lot of these plot points are exactly the same. Mm -hmm. You know, the stuff about Negro Day, the a lot of the opening is very much the same. We just get more of there's a lot more of the parents mm -hmm. of uh, Christopher Walken and John Travolta because you've got Christopher Walken and John Travolta, I presume. Or you had, you know, Harvey Firestein and I don't know who was playing the father in the Broadway version. But how do you, of course, you're going to use those people, <laughs> right? You use so, them to their best um, ability. Yeah, of course. My main criticism with this movie and it's you know my only thing about it is it's it's too long it's you know you were saying when we were talking about the original of the the original like clips along really fast and that's what keeps it feeling so fresh i think you know that's why you can watch it over and over and over again mm -hmm. i don't think i could watch this over and over and over again there's too many songs there are just too many songs way more than there needs to be this, that's like broadway i'm making a cup of coffee and i gotta have a whole song about it and, and now i'm you know i'm gonna go buy some gum and i gotta have a song about that it's it's, it's too many i guess because uh, michelle pfeiffer has a whole song in there and there's a she has two songs yeah and that's she has the crab one which is good yeah and then she has the one with christopher walken where she's trying to seduce him or make it look like she's seducing him uh, and, <sighs> It's too many. It's too many. I loved, but Angela also in the group pointed on, I think Christopher Walken and John Travolta have great chemistry. Oh, absolutely. They do. They're you really buy them as a, as, as a that couple. they love each other yep. as a couple with a history. Totally. Yeah. yeah. Styles keep a changing. The world's rearranging. But Edna, you're timeless to me. <laughs> Hemlines are shorter, a beer costs a quarter, but time cannot take what comes free. You like a stinky old cheese, babe, just getting riper with age. You like a fatal disease, babe, what? but there's no cure, so let this fever rage. Some folks can't stand it, say time is a bandit, but I take the opposite view cause when i need a lift time brings a gift another day with you a twister of waltz it's all the same schmaltz with just a change in the scenery 
You'll never be old hat. That's that. You're timeless to me. Feds keep a fading, Castro's invading, but Wilbur, you're timeless to me. Hairdos are higher, mine feels like barbed wire, but you say I'm chic as can be. You're like. I love the casting of this. John Travolta looks like he's having a great time. He seems like completely. He's killing it. He's killing he it. He is killing it. And Christopher Walken he really, was a dancer he really for years. Is, he really seems like he's definitely like tri- in the original. Like you really buy the Tracy, the Tracy Edna relationship is so mm-hmm. you just really buy it. You really buy that Ricky Lake and Divine have this relationship and they really love each other and they're really rooting for each other. And then in the exact same way, you really believe that Nikki Blonsky and, and John Travolta are like our mother and daughter like you totally buy it i love when they go to the hefty hideaway and then uh, and then michelle pfeiffer is such a bitch to them <laughs> she's terrible she's so evil but she's great i mean she looks she always looks it's great. really good she I mean, does it so well she does it very well i mean yeah most of those this in the hefty hideaway by the way that's where we have jerry stiller they, they, yeah they put him there there's there's not too much that changes i do like the part like they still go to the dance and they they want to integrate the show and there's this yeah that's all very much the same i Um, like that they give inez a chance to dance i do like that so that's that is the big difference is that um in the original version there's a dance-off between tracy and vitamin c what's your character name? amber mm-hmm. they have the dance off and tracy wins and in her roach dress and she's crowned and they integrate the park hooray um in this version tracy shows up um she's been on the run from the law she looks amazing she's dancing she's dancing really super well but then inez gets to dance and inez slays it over everybody else and She's it's a call-in thing. Like people are because they're doing it live people are on television. People calling in and voting right. for her. So that whole number is so good, so good. Like that last number is super, super, super well done. Like you do really leave on a high note, and I like that. That little Inez is the one who eventually wins the the competition and the and the there's a there are talent agents in the audience, right? And we're assuming that they're going to hire her or make her a star. Uh, I love it. I love yeah. it. I love the end of this movie. I think is great that last number has got to be exhausting to do you can't stop <gasps> right the music. it is like those poor high kids energy i mean to announce that amber von tussle is about to get out dance tracy turnblad <laughs> In those 60s I was like, okay, now we're gonna now Queen Latifah's got to sing a verse. These kids are like, oh, are you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else gonna sing a verse? So <laughs> keep dancing through. <laughs> Jerry Stiller, you got anything to say? Do you get, oh my God! <laughs> um, I saw Bullets Over Broadway, the the uh, oh, musical. Yeah. And Woody oh. Allen was there. It was terrible. Um, not good. Yeah, I know. It had a great, like, middle section, and then it just dies. It was one of those musicals. They did not know what they were doing. But at the very end, the cast sings, Yes, we have no bananas. Okay? Oh, that's right. But they sang, like, 12 verses of it. Like, every single person got... I mean, it was one of the worst uh. things. I mean, people in the audience were ready to, like, throw bananas on the stage. We were so annoyed. Anyway, this is not a case. This is like, um, when I saw Kinky Boots, I felt this way. Like, it ends on mm-hmm. such a high note that you're just, like, you leave the theater dancing. Like, this is why yeah, you go it's see really something good. live. It's a, it's a super good ender. 
it's just, they really like it's as long as it is. And I'm, you know, I, and I do feel it's just, it's like four songs too long at least. Um, but they really close it, man. Then when, you know, when you are so pumped and happy and excited, that whole number is so intense and so high energy that you just leave feeling great. Love it. I was going to tell a story about Woody Allen. Um, I'm, I'm going to tell it now just because uh, we're not going to talk about Woody Allen ever. I, d- I didn't see Woody Allen. Todd did. We were we had just moved to New York City. We had just moved to New York City and we had no jobs. We were living in a tiny apartment. Uh, it was 16 feet long and seven feet wide. I'll never forget. It was on 72nd and 1st. We lived behind the High Life Lounge. And back in those days, there was no internet. There were no cell phones. And in order to find a job, you had to do what? Look in the newspaper, right? Yep. And so it was a whole thing that you could go out the night before and buy the New York Times like as soon as it hit the newsstand, which if you were looking for a job or looking for an apartment, that's what you had to and do. And the Village Voice, you would remember? Get the job. Oh, in the village voice. And you would have to get the jump on everybody else and just be there waiting for to get the, the newspaper. So Todd and I went out in the middle of the night because we were both looking for jobs. We just moved there and we go out. We lived on the Upper East Side and um, go to the newsstand. We're buying the newspapers and we're walking back to our place with them. And Todd's like, Look, I'm looking to cross the street because even at that hour, you know, there's still traffic and I'm trying to like get back to the apartment and because it's cold and I want to go back. And um, I was like, look, 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 look. And I'm, by the time I look, he's like, ah, oh, you missed it. He said that there was a, that uh, uh, there was a cab. I think it was a cab. And Woody Allen was in the back of the cab and he was like staring at us. But yeah, like Todd was Todd was noticing like, oh, it's it's Woody Allen. But Woody Allen was like like staring at us. Like, well, doesn't Todd have he red said, hair? Like, he does. Um, like as if he knew us or something. It was it was just odd that it caught Todd's attention, and um, for like an extended period of time until the cab um, drove away. But and he used to see Woody Allen all the time. I never once saw him because we lived on the like we lived on the Upper East Side, and this was all when that all was going down. Um, yeah, with the with his breakup with Mia Farrow, and so people saw them all the time. But I never, I never once saw him. He was like Snuffleupagus. People always like, did you see Woody Allen just oh, came into the shot? And it's I was like, Patrick oh, I Stewart for me. So Patrick Stewart, he and his mm. wife live here part time, and everyone walks into them. Everyone, not me. <laughs> I've, nope. I never, no, once, I never once saw him. I wanted to say also that I saw a Hairspray, uh, I Cry Baby. So that was another like. John Waters had this thing in the 80s where he was doing more mainstream ish. Yeah. Serial Mom. Serial I loved Serial Mom. Serial Mom's great. awesome. Yeah. Crybaby with Johnny Depp, which was fine. Patricia Hearst was in there. Like he liked to hire mm-hmm. like a wreck, but that was also a musical that I saw because Hairspray did so well that they tried to. And uh, another one, like too many songs, too many. I, I, I don't know. Oh, why. Way too many songs in that. Yeah. Yeah. There's just, uh, I don't know why they do that. The, those shows have to be at least two hours and i or they don't make their money i don't know what it is right. is that what it is because it is it is like okay we got like, like, need another three pad another up. three minutes here these yeah. seats are uncomfortable <laughs> i need some air i need to I get out pee. i gotta pee i gotta get out i mean i'm just like there's some point with with broadway i just get like that but this is one of those shows that everybody saw and i could see why i liked the tv version fine i do like those live tv versions because there is an air of excitement around them anything you know people do screw up sometimes and that adds to the whatever but of all these things that we've talked about and i love going back into a john waters time warp thing for me it made me so happy i mean it's got to be the original movie and it oh yeah no no question it's so good all and this is like always we always say this about a good adaptation whether it's from a book or a magazine article or anything like that all of the best things about the adaptation are the things that are straight out of the original yeah um so, you know, I, I like the choices that were made in the musical, especially with Michelle Pfeiffer's character and the ending, I think, is super good. Um, I think if it had been the like a, the original ending, it probably wouldn't have hit quite as big Broadway splashy kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it does that. It totally delivers that. But, oh, yeah, no question. The original movie. I want to mention, too, also John Waters' Christmas album, one of the best Christmas albums of all time. Have you ever heard that album? No. 
oh, you got to get it. It's not easy to find anymore. Um, but he put out, I, I don't remember when it was, I'm going to say at least 10 years ago. Um, he put out this Christmas album of all of these crazy, kooky Christmas songs that he remembered from his youth. And when he put the album out originally, he'd have like a little cabaret show. So he would kind of talk about each song and then play it. Uh, it is one of, the, we play it every Christmas. It is such a great album. But just because his take is so sharp and funny, but also loving in a way. And and um, yeah, he really he skewers America with great love, I feel. Yeah. Yeah. He and really genuinely loves things like the Corny Collins show and, um, you know, tacky music and American Christmas. He, he really loves this kind of stuff, but he also doesn't love it so much that he's blind to its shortcomings that i could never i couldn't say anything better than that that's like that's mm -hmm. just perfectly what he does and he creates these really wonderful characters and i have to say like every time i watch this movie the original movie divine impresses me every single time <sighs> just completely i buy it i completely buy the I mother don't, daughter for a nanosecond not buy that yeah and jerry still is the, the second father. you see her and she's ironing you're like oh there's her mom there's her mom yeah Mm -hmm. it's it's all just it's really well it's so exuberant and there's so much love for what's going on here it's mm -hmm. josh charles did we mention he's one of the kids iggy he's a great dancer <laughs> that's true <laughs> oh no yeah i know that's before um what's that other movie you were in i'm blanking Hold oh on. um uh Dead Poet Society. Dead Poet oh, Society. Oh. He's from Baltimore. He he and Ed. Is um, he really? He's a Baltimore kid. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. And uh, not Edward Hoffman. That's my friend. There's another Edward Nor Norton. Ed Norton's from Baltimore. I tried to get an audition yeah. for this movie and couldn't get it. Really? Yeah. Oh, that's funny. Yeah. Yeah. He's a very good dancer. Super good dancer. And he's good. Um, he doesn't say much of anything if anything at all but he's a good like background face actor um snotty kid he's you know you, you get this whole characterization out of him there's the girl for, in the show for being a background guy that she wears this black and white dress that's striped <sighs> i love yeah her. And I exactly who I, you mean. I totally like i don't notice her these kids time. are really good they're great dancers they're, they're super good and they're great at reacting what's happening around them like mm -hmm. they look like the real thing it's like everyone's just i i saw a clip before you and i got on the air and it's um it's one of the thir it's the 30th reunion and they had, you know, obviously Divine wasn't there, but Debbie Harry mm -hmm. was there. Mm -hmm. Colleen Fitzpatrick, who I, vitamin C, who I wanted to hear from, but the person who wouldn't shut up was Pia Zadora. Like every time they <laughs> asked a question, she just, you know, he loved me from the lonely lady. And even John Waters like, yeah, okay, right. Okay. okay. okay <laughs> calm down. <laughs> But it was fun to see Ricky and and all those people. And they, they say, like, it's the it was the most fun they have. And when people recognize them, it always, like, it's a joyful thing. It's just like... Mm -hmm. it, and it, it's... Just, if you've never seen Hairspray, especially the original movie, just stop what you're doing. Watch it right now. It's, oh, why are you watching it now? Do it. <laughs> it will make you happy. It just... And if you ever get an opportunity to see it on a big screen... Yes. Don't pass that up. Because it's really like it's cool. Like it, it works so well on television on a small screen, but on a big screen, I it's a while, so good. But I loved it. I had a, the VHS of it. I mm -hmm. took it with me when I moved cross country. Like that was one of those movies I had with me because I just want to always have it. Mm -hmm. Well, so should we talk about what we're doing next? Yes. Let's talk about what we were doing next, because we again, we've had kind of Tennessee, these folks in Tennessee on our mind. Um, somebody on Twitter, and I think I still have it here up on my phone. Jeffrey. Uh oh, what happened to you? Oh, man, it's gone. A man named Jeffrey Omora. I don't know if that's a I should know who that is or not, but publish. I mean, a lot of people are publishing lists of, of shows that can't be um, put on stage in Tennessee anymore. And among the shows, uh, I mean, of course, there's like Shakespeare <laughs> and Oscar Wilde, as we discussed last time. Um, but among the shows is La Cage Folle. I 
am what I am. Speaking of Harvey Firestein. <laughs> so we thought we might do that. And we're going to pair it with the birdcage, which is. The, yes. Which, so that's the adaptation. It's a little of the backwards. Musical. We're starting with a musical and going to a non-musical. Um, but we just want to talk about those two movies. It's <laughs> great writing. It's, and yeah. it's just it's yeah, we need to support this kind of art and we need to go out there and let stop these stupid laws that are happening and mm-hmm. bring some beauty and trash back into the world that makes it fun. Yeah. The good kind of trash. Yeah. Exactly. Well, that's going to be our next episode. And please feel free to reach out to us with your eyes.